It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 134, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Barb and Dave Perkins raise 30 acres of vegetables at Vermont Valley Community Farm in Blue Mounds, Wisconsin, where they farm since 1994. Packing 850 CSA boxes each week, Barb and Dave work hard to keep their CSA community active in the farm with festivals, community days, and worker shares. We take a deep dive into how their worker share program functions and how it fits into their overall labor strategy, a strategy that includes two adult children in management positions on the farm. Barb and Dave dig into how they've structured their workdays to work for their employees and how they're starting the discussion about transitioning the farm to the next generation. Dave takes us on a tour of the seed potato business, including how it fits into the labor, marketing, and business aspects of Vermont Valley Farm. We also discuss the basics of the business planning that led Barb and Dave to operate at a large scale in a short amount of time, how they mechanized the operation from day one, and how they manage mulching with their own hay and straw for fertility and weed suppression on a large acreage. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by CoolBot by Store It Cold. You can build an affordable walk-in cooler powered by a CoolBot and a window air conditioning unit. Save up to 83% on upfront costs and up to 42% on monthly electrical bills compared to conventional cooling systems. And by Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. And by BCS America, BCS two wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. Gear driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSAmerica.com. Barb and Dave Perkins, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Morning, Chris. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, good to be here. Thanks so much for joining me on a, well, kind of a, a gray and drizzly late August Sunday morning here in southern Wisconsin. It sure is. Kind of cozy. <laughs> yeah, you never know in Wisconsin what the next day is going to be. So this is a more of a fall day than a summer day. That's right. So I'd like to start off today by having you guys tell us about Vermont Valley Community Farm. When did you guys get started and, and what are you doing and how much of it are you guys doing? Okay, I'd love to give you some background on the farm. Um, Dave and I bought this farm in 1994. We were living in the city of Madison, Wisconsin, and we were living right downtown, both working city jobs. And we decided that we wanted to get back to the country. Um, we had lived on a farm in the early 80s for three years and then moved to Madison where left that farm, moved to Madison and, um, you know, lived in a house in a neighbor in an old neighborhood and had a garden. And that was about it. Um, we were introduced to CSA in 1992 when the first CSAs came to Madison and the Madison area CSA coalition, which is now called fair share was formed. And we found out about CSA. We joined one. We thought it made so incredible much sense. Um, we got really excited about it. And after belonging to our CSA for just a short while, a few months, um, we realized that this is what we could do. Um, we had wanted to move to the country, back to the country for a while, but we had no idea how we could, how we could make a living. So we thought, aha, this is how we could do it. Now, we do have some background, and um, we'll sort of let you know the background that we actually came into the farm on, not just, aha, let's just do this. Yeah, the, uh, I grew up on a farm in southern Wisconsin. Uh, back in the day, it was, it was a diversified farm. Uh, the term wasn't used then. Uh, everything was diversified uh, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and basically I grew up on a farm that, uh, as the farms began to consolidate, uh, we were organic when I was a little guy and didn't use that term, but, uh, transitioned to chemical agriculture because that's what agriculture was doing at the time. Uh, I went on for an agronomy degree, worked in the, the egg industry, selling pesticides and all that kind of wonderful things for uh, several years before we transitioned back to the city. Um, or the, that's the, 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 the background. Once we kept kind of more involved and in, uh, I got more involved in the politics of agriculture, I, I uh, really kind of learned that the, the chemical egg was not the way to go and that converted to organic agriculture. And that's ended up 
falling in with the timing of the discovery of the community supported agriculture model. And what intrigued me was the uh, the model itself uh, turned uh, agriculture on its head. Everything about it was pretty much the opposite of the agriculture I grew up under. Uh, the primary thing is it put the farmer in control. Uh, I just grew up remembering my uh, father and all their farmers, for that matter, uh, complaining about price, complaining about weather, complaining about this and that. And it was essentially because they had no control over really anything they did. Uh, and what the, this model, the CSA model, does is it, it flipped all that. It puts the farmer in control of uh, what they grow, when they grow it, what they earn. Uh, so for me, that was the intriguing thing that uh, uh, brought us back to the country, back to the farm. I, I just I just had to try and see if it would work. Now, you guys are a pretty large CSA operation now, right? Yeah, we got large fairly quickly when we left. Um, we left Madison and we wanted to replace our city income with farm income. And we gave ourselves five years to do that. We thought there was no reason that we should just because we were farming um, accept a lower income than we than we had been making. So we set a goal of 500 shares in five years and we succeeded. We did it five years into our CSA venture. We were up to 500 CSA shares. I, I, I say it like, oh, we just did it. It was it wasn't easy. It was a lot of work. We worked. I felt like we feel like we worked around the clock. We worked seven days a week and we had to market, market, market because CSA was not a household word. Um, most people did not know what it was, had no idea about the concept. Um, so we really had to beat the pavement and, and introduce the concept to the community. Madison and the surrounding community is, is very open-minded. It's a progressive community. They have a very, very large farmer's market. So we were, we were definitely talking to people who were interested. Our first year, we had 50 CSA shares, and we we headed up from there. Yeah, I mean, our our driver in terms of size is the economic side of the picture. Uh, again, I grew up on a farm. I was used to what it means to be a poor farmer. I had zero interest in that. Uh, uh, farming needs to be respected, meaning in our culture, it needs to be paid. Uh, so if we didn't meet our income expectations, I had no intention of continuing to do the CSA. So it really, the model really had to work not only for the people getting the, the organic produce, but it had to work for the farmers as well. So, uh, the size of our farm and the, uh, the plans and the design was based around, uh, making it a, a good economic adventure for, uh, the Barb and I and our family. So you started off with a goal of 500 CSA shares. How many do you guys have now? How many boxes are you guys packing every week? Well, this is interesting. This We are now packing about 850 boxes a week this season. But five seasons ago, we were packing 1,280 boxes a week. We peaked um, about Five years ago, I don't know the exact year, we peaked at close to 1,300 CSA shares. We stayed there for two years, and we have been slightly decreasing every year for the last five years. It's a, it's a trend that's happening with a lot of CSA farms, um, not only in the area, but in other states as well as we talk to farmers. So we are still large, but um, five years ago, we were actually considerably larger. And the size at that point, I mean, we just kept growing. It was all a word of mouth thing. So uh, how how large we got, that was sort of a, or how large we let ourselves get. Uh, the one year we cut it off, uh, it was a, a little bit of figuring out as you go, you know, what it meant is with more people and got more land and better equipment and that sort of thing. So uh, we were at a point at one point where, you know, do we really need to be this big? Well, people want to join. Do we want to turn them away? So, you know, it's sort of a, for our individual farm, it was a, a learning process. And then on its own, it began to 
decline and you know at 850 boxes we're absolutely fine with that number it's not a problem for the farm even though you could say well sales are going down well we've just adjusted and it's changed things we hire fewer people that sort of thing but uh sort of the the size thing is is a it was a driver to get big enough to be financially stable at this point you know we can just uh roll with the with the market so you guys don't see that as a as an imminent disaster for Vermont Valley. No, absolutely not. I think I see it actually as a positive sign from the perspective that, you know, the fair share CSA coalition in southern Wisconsin, we've done a lot as a coalition to uh help other CSAs get going. Uh, the coalition has been very successful in accomplishing that. Uh, the number of farms is uh, that's, that's just in the coalition is very significant. I think it's around 60 farms, but there's a lot of farms outside the coalition that have benefited from all our combined work together. You know, we have a listserv that we share lots of information that goes across, you know, the Midwest or beyond. So, you know, the, the CSA movement has grown like exponentially, which I, from my perspective, that's a good thing. I, I understand I'm creating quote unquote competition for our farm, but I'm absolutely fine with that. So uh, what's going on is there's going to be a lot of farms. There's going to be a lot of farms that are getting good at what they do. They're getting bigger, you know, not as big as we are, but they're getting bigger. Uh, they're getting, you know, solid and successful. So, you know, within our, our, you know, our market, which is, you know, Dane County, Wisconsin, primarily Madison. Uh, you know, there's, we, we probably had enough farms, you know, to service this area, but you know, it's, it's spreading out all over the place. So it's, it's from our own farms, personal situation. It's not a problem at all. In fact, it, in some ways it's kind of welcome. We, we don't have to do as much, uh, in other ways, that's a really good thing because now there's a lot more farms that are making a good living on CSA. Now, is CSA the only way that you guys sell your produce? Yes, it's always been the only way. So when we started this farm, we were really um, taken by the model. It made so much sense to us. And it was our goal from the beginning to sell our produce only through CSA. We felt that we could do a really good job marketing one way, putting a lot of focus and emphasis on our members, involving our members in as many ways possible on our farm and not have to think about like how we're going to divide our produce amongst different markets. Now this has, you know, it's, um, I say in some ways maybe more complicated because our mass has to be so impeccable and we have to figure out what we're planting because everything that we grow that comes off this farm gets divided amongst our CSA members. We don't want to give them too much of anything. We don't want to give them too little of anything. So we've kept really good records over the years so that we can, um, so that we can try to accomplish that. We do um, very generous donations. If we end up with just too much of something, um, there's community centers and food pantries in the city that will take large volumes of, of our overage and our, um, a lot of our seconds produce that we don't deliver to our CSA members. And the one uh, exception to that is uh, going back about 12 years ago uh, with uh, the adoption of the organic uh, federal law, there was a requirement for organic seed. Uh, and uh, we decided to uh, do our part and uh, cre we created a, another business on the farm and that's growing organic seed potatoes, uh, which we grow uh our intent was for, you know, the regional farmers, you know, market farmers, CSAs, and that's who we market to. So it's over the years, uh, that's grown. Uh, it's a, it's a separate activity. I mean, we do use the potatoes in for our CSA as well, but that's, uh, uh, for our, from our CSA's perspective, you know, it guarantees them a, a nice potato delivery every year because we're growing a, a bunch more for seed potatoes. Uh, and in addition to that, since we're doing the seed potatoes, we offer garlic for a seed too. So we do have a seed business that's uh, grown and isn't aside from the CSA, but in terms of all our, you know, 40, 50 different uh, uh, vegetables that we grow, that's, that's all for the CSA. Because you're relying so heavily on the CSA and, and you guys, it's kind of interesting. You've got community right in the name, Vermont Valley Community Farm. 
Mm-hmm. What do you guys do to to emphasize that community aspect and and keep your customers or your members engaged in the farming operation? Well, one thing we do that's been that's been very um, popular and effective is we hold multiple events and festivals on the farm. So we have a corn boil, a pesto fest, and a pumpkin pick. Those are all events where all of our members are invited to come out to the farm. They don't pay anything in addition. And they're all hands-on. The pesto fast people actually pick their basil, make the pesto right here on the farm. The corn boil, they head out in the fields, they pick their ears of corn, come back, and we boil it over a, over a, over a fire and have a big potluck and farm party. And then for the pumpkin pick, all of our members can come out and pick one, take one pumpkin per person home with them. So the festivals are fun, but we've realized the real key to an effective, to a, to a fun festival that's going to be well attended is they get something out of it and they actually have an experience in the field. And so that's what all three of those festivals do. In addition, we do tomato you picks for our, for our members and just for our members. We plant about a quarter acre of Roma tomatoes and um, hot peppers and tomatillos and invite the members to come out every weekend for four weeks in a row um, to harvest Roma tomatoes. We now we give each share 10 pounds at no cost. So that's a lot of people's incentive to come out. But a lot of people walk home with 40, 50, 60 pounds. Um, we do charge a small amount for every pound over the 10. Yesterday we had um, a tomato you pick, 2,200 pounds of tomatoes walked off of the farm. About a hundred, somewhere between 150 and 200 people were here, and it was all done in an hour and a half. So we've gotten pretty efficient at like at running these things, not taking up too much of our weekend time, having it really organized, getting people out here, having a fabulous experience, um, going home with tomatoes, being really happy. So those are the things that we do. In addition to our festivals, we have a worker share program on our farm. So um, Members can come out for four hours a week on a scheduled basis, same day, same time each week, and work for the season 20 weeks for their CSA share. Um, It's been a really big program, and for the first five years of our CSA, it was our main source of labor. Um, We had one season, we had 60, 60 um, worker shares spread out over the week, morning and afternoon. They were the, the workforce, the labor force on this farm, and that's when we were probably at about Six seven hundred CSA shares. Um, we still have a worker share program. We've realized that worker shares obviously need to be micromanaged, and we need we need full time staff that can manage worker shares. I was not able to do it all at some point, so we have a few hired full time employees year round, and those employees now can um, you know lead crews of worker shares. But we still have um, still a main part of part of our labor force. So and part of the concept we learned over time was that uh, making the offer is uh, as important as people accepting the offer in terms of events and festivals and whatnot. And, uh, it's, you know, people, it's kind of like you can get invited to a party. You may not be able to make it, but you appreciate the fact you're invited. So even though, you know, if you did a percentage basis, it's not a huge percentage of our members show up. You know, it's significant numbers, uh, but just even uh, making the offer. Uh, uh, matters. And then from the farmer's perspective, too, Barb mentioned it, but, you know, we figured out how to make these low impact on us. Uh, you know, just think of the event and, uh, and, you know, just as simple as our, you know, our corn boil, it's a, it's a uh, hot luck and uh, no trash days on the farm. Just real, you know, simple things, just as like make it less work for the farmer and, and people just appreciate the being on the farm and having the offer and, and that's that's very important to make the connection with the, the members. When you guys have people there, you're out there working the crowd and keeping things moving and, and doing the meet and greet, right? Oh yeah, our festivals are not like um hangout party days for us. They it is it's a they're a lot of work. They're exhausting. I it's more exhausting for me to be talking to members for three hours at a corn boil than it is for me to be working in the fields for a ten hour day. Because yeah, we're we're, we're on, we're, yeah, we're exactly, we're working the crowd, we're meeting our members, we're engaging, we're, we're answering questions, we're giving information, we're, you know, 
talking to all the little kids. Yeah, it's that's that's the that's the huge intent of these as well. That we really want to meet our members. We really want our members to meet us. Do you have members who've stayed with you for a long time? I mean, what kind of a turnover rate do you guys have? Oh, we do have members that have. We do have our core group of members that have been with us for twenty three years, and we have a lot of members that have been with us for fifteen plus years. It's interesting as we track our 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 membership now over all of these years, we have people leave, let's say after 10 years, after five years, and then maybe five or eight years later, they come back again. It's like, okay, the kids all left the house. You know, we're doing more traveling, blah, blah, blah. And then we get an email, we're joining again. And, and so as we've looked at these, at, at our membership over the years, um, it's been a lot of people, people, a fair amount of people that actually come and go for really good reasons. We're traveling this year. We're, you know, whatever. We have a sick parent this year that we need to take care of and we're going to take the year off. So that's been really interesting and it's really been really fun to us. And, but people, when they, when they discontinue their membership, they often make a point of telling us, Hey, your produce is fabulous. We really appreciate it. We're going to tell our friends about it. It's not because we didn't like it. We just really weren't able to use it. We really figured out a lot about ourselves. We don't do a lot of cooking at home. We only eat five vegetables. And so we get that kind of feedback all the time from people. So, and then there are constant, continually new people in Dane County finding out about CSA and joining. So it feels like a bit of a revolving door sometimes, although we do have kept this solid core group um, for many years. Yeah. And I mean, we're 23 years for us now, so it's, and really the gamut. I mean, uh, uh, we have members who are new members who first came out here as children. So we have second generation members. Uh, we have members who have been great members who have passed away. Uh, that's how long we've been doing this. Uh, uh, we have members. It's sort of you get all these personal stories by doing the CSA and by having the events and having, you know, opportunities to interact with people personally. So, you know, that's uh, the reward part of doing this model is, you know, you're not just bringing your produce to the co-op or the store and dropping it off. You, you, you know, it's not like that with a lot of people, everybody, well, it actually is with a lot of people over time. Uh, but you end up having personal relationships. Uh, it's, you know, not best buddies, but it's like real personal relationships. What you're doing really means something to them. You know, you had weddings on the farm, you know, you, people are just excited if they can bring their three year old or three day old <laughs> to the corn boil. So it's, you know, there's, it's a real, uh, real meaningful personal thing that goes on with, uh, a community supported farm so the the model really works in every way uh, you know this connection isn't doesn't happen for everybody the the CSA box doesn't work for everybody uh, so in the beginning I was really really tracked hard uh, the turnover and who's not coming back and da 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 but as time went on and I realized we're we're doing a quality product there, there's no question about that and we learn why people are leaving and, and discover while well, they're leaving, they come back, uh, uh, they rotate around. It's just kind of not an issue in my brain anymore. Uh, just, you know, I accept that it's, it's, it doesn't work for everybody. And for some people, it's incredibly important. Uh, so you just accept that. Now, your CSA shares are, it's what I think of as being a traditional CSA share. You guys you guys are picking vegetables, putting them in a box, and then and then delivering them to residences in Madison, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. And the other way that we we explain our box to people is we have we like to focus on the the more common vegetables that people know what to do with. So we will do, make multiple deliveries of what people understand and know, and then we will do fewer deliveries of the more what most people consider, consider unusual vegetables. So we're introducing people to unusual vegetables, but we're giving them more quantity and, and um, repetitive deliveries of broccoli and potatoes and onions and green beans and tomatoes and things they really know what to do with. So people appreciate that. And we've really learned that through surveying our members for year after year after year, really hearing what they want more of and what they want less of. So we're not willing to, you know, 
say, we're no, we're not going to deliver beets just because, you know, a lot of you say we hate beets because we think that everyone should learn how to eat everything. But um, we really have listened to what they like and don't like and focus our percentage of deliveries on those items. And we've done that from the get go. Our two years when we were a member of a CSA and, uh, and before we start our own, that's, we, we did it real intentionally to, to see what we thought, how we felt about things. And that's what we came away with. And so that's been our, our philosophy from the get go. Barb, can you talk a little bit more about the worker shares and what your expectations are from people who are participating in that and how you keep that organized? Sure. Um, my expectations are really high and I think that's, that's the driver. So I schedule people. There's, I offer morning shifts and afternoon shifts and they start and end at a certain time. And I expect the worker shares to be there on time, not one or two minutes after the time we start at 6 45 AM. They're there ready to work at 6 45, not 6 46. And they've learned that because sometimes the truck is pulling out of the driveway like just, you know, and they're pulling in. It's like, whoops, there goes the truck. Um, so I have really clear expectations on, on time. And we honor, we honor the, the ending time too. If they can't make a shift, they can make it up. We get that makeup shift on the calendar right away. And then as far as the work that they're involved in on the farm, um, they work with the crew. And so they're always being supervised. They're always working with an employee of the farm. and we have them doing everything that we have everybody else doing all the harvest jobs, all the packing shed jobs, all the weeding jobs, anything that crew or employees do um, worker shares do. And we expect them to do it well. And we expect them to work hard and we expect them to have the physical stamina and, you know, they don't worker shares don't come from an agricultural background, but they, by having these expectations on them, they really strive to, to do their best. And it has, and they, as I said, mentioned before, they expect to be micromanaged. And so that's how we treat them and giving them every single detail of every single job all of the time and not hesitating to give them a correction if it's not how we want to see it done. And they've told me time after time, they really appreciate that. They don't know what they're supposed to do. They really appreciate being told and being given all the detail because then they're learning as well. Um, we get a really diverse group of people that, that come out to do the worker share. I mean, we have, we have prof- this year, I'm just thinking of a group, we have professors, nurses, um, we've had, you know, just, we've had doctors, we've had real estate agents, um, any, pretty much any, per, any profession you can think of, we've had them on the farm. And it makes for a really, um, really interesting conversation, really interesting group of people. We get to know them really well. They get to know us really well. They're probably the, they're just key advocates for the farm too, because they're, um, they really understand the farm really well. I have to say that part of it is me as a person. I enjoy working with people. Um, I I worked in nonprofits before I came to farming. Um, I've always been in a position where I've been in charge of people um, I'm a, I'm a bit of a people person and I'm also a, a, a real direct person when it comes to, to teaching and leading. And so I really, I really enjoy working with all these different people and keeping them on, on task. I can say some farmers I've talked to really don't have the interest that I do in, in, um, in running a group of, uh, worker shares and, and hurting the cats, um, week after week, which, you know, I comically can think of it as sometimes. It's interesting that to me that you say you get a lot out of these people because, and and you talk about things like being able to correct them and then uh, them appreciating that correction because the standard trope now for finding employees is that it's, it's hard to impossible to find good workers to come and be part of a vegetable farm and that people don't like criticism. Is there something that you're doing that actually makes that work? Well, employees and worker shares are two different categories. So I have to agree. It is difficult. I think the, when working with employees is really different from working with worker shares. And so 
you know, it's a whole other discussion about finding employees because finding you want to find employees that are going to stay on the farm for multiple years and are going to work independently and are going to care about the farm and feel that things are important as you feel they are. And no, it's not easy to find a person, you know, it's not, it's not real easy to find employees like that that want to stay on your farm. It's easy to, you know, sometimes you have those employees, but then they leave after a year or two to go start their own farm or go on some other venture. Um, so it's real different working with, with the worker shares. Um, so they're the ones who really appreciate the micromanaging and the correction um, more so than the employees do. The employees want to be given more autonomy and more independence, but you can only give them that if they really truly can work independently at an efficient an effective level and lead other people. So that they, they're really very, very different um, groups of, of workers. And on the employee issue, uh, um, you know, when we were way back 24 years ago, I was putting together the plan for, you know, the farm and how it was going to happen. And I was, you know, envisioning it forward. Cause that's what I do. Uh, the, I, I think it did really well with one huge exception. I never thought of being an employer. <laughs> Not for one second did I think of the notion that we were going to be employers. And the reason is I grew up on a farm. We had a big family. It's like, you know, we, we were the workers. And so I never experienced that growing up. In addition, I never grew vegetables, let alone diverse vegetables. I grew up on, you know, cattle and grains and whatnot. So, you know, you really need employees. Uh, so that was a big miss on our part. Uh, and I don't know that we've really ever gotten good at, at this. Uh, so if you're a farmer and you want a get of size and you're going to have employees, you really got to think about what that means. And if that's really what you want to do, I would say, and everything we do here, the, 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 the most, the biggest struggle we have, the, the least fun we have is, is being employers. Uh, we've got a lot of people that we really like and they continue to be friends, but just the whole concept of being an employer, you know, do you, when you look at a business, you know, do you, do you want to be the farmer or do you want to be an employee manager? And if you're a larger or even a small, so even the size we are, we're not large in the world of vegetables. We're large in the world of CSA. You're hiring people. And so you, you need to think you need to actually say, yeah, I want to do that. I want to be an employer. Uh, so that's a that's a, a whole separate challenge. And that's why with the you know the workers shares, it's really a, a totally different relationship, as Barb's pointed out. Now you point out that Dave, when you grew up, your family was providing the labor on the farm. Now you guys actually have your children involved in the farm operation on a daily basis, right? And as, and I should say your adult children. Yes. Um, our, we have two sons and a daughter and our two, they're all in their thirties and our two sons have been working full time and both in management positions on the farm for more than 10 years. Um, then they worked on, you know, that's full time as their, as their career job for more than 10 years. Prior to that, when they were in high school and college, they, they, always, they always worked on the farm as well. Um, it's a benefit because they care about the farm as much as we do. They've been here for so many years. They understand so many aspects of the farm. So it's, it's fantastic having them. Um, our daughter-in-law has been working here now, I think, for seven years. And she runs the office. Yeah. And oops, David, David just corrected me 10 years. Um, she's our office manager. That's been fantastic. And I've been able to give a lot of responsibilities over to her and our daughter cooks for the farm crew. Um, she doesn't really care about farming, but she does. She does love the farm and she grew up here. So she comes back every day, um, actually three days a week, and she cooks food for, um, for the crew. So our whole family is involved. What's it like working with your adult children on the farm? Well, you should probably ask them that too. You might get two different answers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I love it. I love it. I love my kids. We have good relationships. They work hard. Um, I, it's, it's really, it's very fun and very rewarding for me. 
I think we're both hard. Dave and I are hard bosses. We have high expectations and um, they, they've seemed to have risen and, and are, you know, work, they work at that level as well with us. So from my perspective, it's wonderful. And I get to see them every day. Um, I like that. I like my kids. And for me, it's like, I mean, that's how I grew up. That's, you know, my, so it's, it's normal to me. Uh, but being on the flip side of being the boss, it, you know, it does add different dynamics because they're, they're your kids, but, uh, you know, they're your employees too. You go back to this whole employee thing. So it adds another dynamic to the relationship and whatnot. I think fortunately, uh, uh, our farm's uh, financially successful. So we've been able to uh, do well, uh, for our kids as far as their, uh, uh, what they're, how they're compensated and, uh, they recognize that and appreciate it. So it's, it sort of goes back to our prior discussion on whether, uh, the uh, farm is pays the farmers well. Uh, if it doesn't, it, you know, it, it really makes it hard to justify to keep doing it. In fact, uh, the one piece of advice, my father didn't give me much advice, but the one piece he gave me was never farm. Uh, and the reason was because it's hard work, you don't make any money. Uh, so again, we've, we've, it's still hard work, but you know, we've been able to, to pay our kids. So, uh, but the interesting thing to me is it adds another dynamic to your relationship, uh, with your kids because you're, you have this, this work relationship and it's real complicated. It's kind of, it's not something you can really explain. It's there. Each, each of them is individually different because you have all the family dynamics and then you throw on top of it, the work dynamics. So it, it makes for a, a lot of interesting things. Are your children on a track to take over the farm at some point? Well, that's a, that's a, that's a relevant question. Um, we're actually, well, Barb and I, uh, we're both turning 60. Uh, Barb just did, and I do in a, in a couple of weeks. Uh, we're we're kind of looking at an end game here. Uh, and that's causing them to, you know, look sort of forward to the rest of their life. And uh, we're actually in the middle there, in the middle of, you know, making decisions. Uh, do, do we want to do this for another 20 years? They're at the point where, they're in their thirties. They can, you know, they can easily do a career switch, do something else interesting and wonderful in their lives, or they can uh, continue what they've been doing now for, you know, 10 plus years. So uh, we're actually going through conversations and thoughts and decisions about, uh, about that, that very question. And it doesn't have anything to do whether or not uh, the farm could financially do it. It could. Uh, without a doubt, if you know they were able to successfully do what we've done, and then the part of the question is, is uh, do they want to? And then the other question is, do they bring the skill sets to make that happen? But the first question is, is do they want to? And and that's that's really what what we're we're talking about right now, just because you know Barb and I are getting to the point where uh, we're we're going to back off. Uh, so that's. You know, what will happen a year or two or three or four from now? We'll, we'll find out. Is that a conversation that you guys are having with your children on your own? Or have you involved a, a mediator or a consultant in that at all? It's with ourselves. Uh, I don't, this is really kind of personal things. Uh, it's not a, again, it's not an issue of, you know, finances or, you know, business structure. It's really very much a personal Thing in terms of do you want to do this and uh, or not? That's really kind of the first question. Uh, uh, we have a lot of flexibility in terms of if you know they all decide, yeah, we want to keep it going. Uh, at some point there, uh, maybe we bring in a, um, a professional in terms of uh, business structure. But uh, you know, this is this is kind of my forte as well. The, Budget financing. Uh, this is what I I do. It's you know the farm's successful financially for a reason. Uh, so you bring in uh, uh, you know attorneys or that sort of thing if you need to. Uh, otherwise, I want. It depends on you know again your your skill sets that you bring uh, uh, to the farm. Uh, I have skill sets in budget and finance that I bring. Uh, so for us on this farm, it's 
it's not about the finances or the business structure. It's about what our kids want to do for the next 20 years of their lives. Do your sons live on the farm? Uh, very close. Uh, they do not live on the farm. Uh, uh, they both have homes, their own homes, uh, just up the road and uh, within, you know, five, six, seven miles. Uh, so they're, they're close. They do not live on the farm. No one's ever lived on the farm. We've never had interns that have stayed on the farm. That was one thing we were really clear about from the beginning is we work so closely for so many hours with all these people. And we really want them all to go home at night. So that was also a decision. We, you know, had this intern, um, you know, brief in- intern conversation when we first started the farm. And we're like, no, we're not, not having anyone live with us. It's going to be hard enough working with people all day. So it's really good that everyone goes home at night. And uh, our oldest, uh, Jesse and John, uh, John is, uh, is our office manager. They have, they have two, two children as well. So that's, you know, part of the whole personal issues and where they're at in life and everything. So it's, again, it's, it's very individual. It's very, you know, all farms themselves are individual entities with uh, different people, interests and desires. So you mentioned the desirability of having people go home at the end of the day. And one of the things that I remember from some of my early conversations with you guys is that you have kind of an interesting weekly work schedule for yourselves and for your employees. Um, well, we really have structured our work day to get the work to work as efficiently and quickly as we can to get all the work done to keep everybody's hours reasonable. So we start, the employees start at 6.30 in the morning and we end at 4.30. Very, very rarely do we go beyond 4.30. There are, there are just a couple, I'd say five or less times during the whole season. And then we end at noon on Friday. So we start at 6.30 again, and um, our goal is to be done at 12 o'clock. Now, sometimes in the spring when we're transplanting, um, working around weather, we may work as late as one every once in a while, too. But once again, those are outliers. So Dave and I have worked to try to get the right balance of the number of people working on the farm, the right number of labor to very efficiently get the work done within these hours. So people actually know they're going to be able to go home at a certain time. They're going to have a two and a half day weekend. If they leave at noon on Friday, Um, the work is really hard. And so it's, they really appreciated knowing that, that their schedule is, is defined. And um, we also take a one hour lunch break every day. So they are actually able to to lay on the grass and relax at at lunchtime. Now, of course, we learned all this through the through the years. We didn't start out our first one or two or three years with this schedule. And you know, I mean, we Dave and I personally worked you know into sunset every day, as as far as I can recall. Um, but we we really worked hard to get you know all of our systems in place and and um. And try to make the the farm have a really, really sane, um, sane work day. And yeah, you know, that Saturday on the weekends, you know, when you have transplants, there's obviously watering. So Barb gets the water transplants all you know weekend and take care of those. So there's things that go through the weekend. We live at the farm. We do that. You know, the the business side. You know, Barb and I, we're we're not done within those hours. Uh, uh, particularly in prior times, we're getting a little bit better at it, but there's more to do. We have phone calls, come members, and that sort of thing. So, as the as the on-site farmers, the uh, you know, our personal line is our farm line. Uh, you know, we we do things through the weekend, but in terms of everyone else, uh, they they have that schedule. Uh, we, for our occasion, like our weekend, you know, festivals, uh, people come and help out a little bit, but, but for our staff, they've got a good schedule. And where do you guys find your full-time employees? Well, <laughs> we're both chuckling. Um, you know, as Dave mentioned earlier, you know, being employers has been the biggest challenge for us. I'd say mostly they have found us. We'll, you know, put a posting on our, on our website, for example, in a job description, but um, people have found us. It's, you know, they've heard about us. They're searching for a farm to work on. So, you know, I wouldn't say that I want to, I'm by any stretch an expert on, on finding, on finding employees and finding the top notch employees and keeping them here on the farm. But, you know, the farm has really run quite well for 23 years. So, and the, and 
You know, I think the fact that we are in Dane County and we are close to Madison and close to the university also will bring a certain type of of employee to our farm. You know, and and I think where where yeah where we're physically located has been um, has been helpful. Yeah, and for you know uh, better or worse, you know, and again, I I don't think uh, we're the experts to talk about finding employees. Uh, one philosophy I've gone for, as we've learned more, is to try to find local people who have a life and aren't going anywhere. Uh, you know, because we, we what we what we uh, between ourselves call our farmer wannabes, and those you know people often are great and wonderful and you know have motivation, but we also know they're going to be here two years at the most. I mean, we we we, we know what's going to happen, but uh, you know we. We bring those people in anyways over the years. Uh, the, the people who tend to stay are the ones who have no intent. And if we can find a, a good person who has a life and they have other things going and they're living here already, you know, that's the, that's kind of been our, at least my kind of theory on, well, maybe they'll stay longer. It hasn't really panned out that way, so we've kind of been <laughs> doing different things Uh to try to think a way to get people to stay because bar will take them out for the whole season and spend hours and hours and hours and hours training people on this and that and that and this. And, you know, the next year they're gone or we get them a second year and, you know, and bar can talk about it more, but the second year, that's when people are going to ramp up. That's when they, they know what they're doing. And then the third year they're gone. Oh, geez, they just finally got good. Uh, and then we're flexible with, you know, our employees too. It's like we hire somebody, we thought they were going to do this and we discovered, well, you know, they're not very, really, ain't really any good at that, but we discovered, wow, they're, they're good at this and we need that too. So, uh, we sort of, you know, the, 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 the people we have, we've altered what we have them do based on what we learn they're good at. So that's been one of our employee management, you know, techniques we've done. And, you know, that's, that's been successful. I think that's probably the one thing we've learned and has been successful is to, you got somebody and what are they good at? Well, let's slot them in over there and have them do that instead. When, you know, I, I'm always interested in hi- in hiring a crew leader and people apply for the job of crew leader and that's what they want to do. But, um, I've actually stopped specifically hiring crew leader and just hiring crew and let that crew show me where their strengths are. Because some people that I never would have guessed based on their background would be a crew, good crew leader really are. And some people that I, based on their interview, just sort of wowed me and like, wow, they're, they're going to be an amazing crew leader. And they don't have the skills. Um, the other thing is, looking at the personality of the person and not their resume and not what they've done seem, seems to be more telling. So just who they are as a person, it's like someone, someone who is really good with people and can lead crews. That's just who they are. They're born that way. They're, that's their personality. And so I've come to really, really learn that about people too. I'm a, I'm a bit of a people person. If you haven't kind of seen that already, I'm, my degree is in sociology, and I've always worked with people prior to farming, and so I'm always I'm fascinated by people, and I'm fascinated by personalities and by skill sets and by learning styles. I'm always being challenged by how does somebody learn something best, and you know, do I need to take them and show them, and do I need to write it on a piece of paper? Do I need to draw a sketch? Do I, you know, I'm really I really try to key into on people's learning styles because if they can, if I can speak to them and teach them in a way that is going to resonate with them and they're going to learn, then it's, it's a win-win. And if I'm going to try to teach them in a way that is not working for them, it's total frustration. So um, that's my particular challenge and, and, and fun working with people. All right. With that, I think this is a good spot for us to stop and take a break, get a quick word from a couple of sponsors, and then we'll be right back with Barb and Dave Perkins from Vermont Valley Community Farm. Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Store It Cold's CoolBot. The CoolBot has changed the way that farmers think about cooling facilities for their vegetables by making it possible to cool a walk-in cooler with a window air conditioning unit with massive savings on the front end and an ongoing electricity and maintenance costs. And now they've taken another step forward and created a turnkey refrigeration solution. 
an energy efficient walk-in cooler designed for easy assembly by you in hours, not days. I know from experience, ugh, painful experience, how much time and energy can go into building a not so great homemade walk-in cooler or looking for a used one that's still in good condition. Save yourself time, save yourself money, and make your produce stand out in the marketplace when it lasts on store shelves and it lasts in walk-in coolers at the restaurant and when it lasts in your customer's refrigerator drawers because you sold it to them cold. If purchasing the CoolBot, please use the code FDF at checkout to double your CoolBot warranty at no charge or mention Farmer to Farmer and receive an exclusive discount on your walk-in cooler at storeitcold.com. Perennial support for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is provided by Vermont Compost Company, makers of Fort B and Fort Light potting mixes. When you buy potting mix from Vermont Compost Company, you're not just buying an input. You're joining a community of growers across the United States. And like the best inputs and the best communities, you're getting a product and a community that really have your back. Vermont Compost Company has been committed to helping farmers make money by growing great transplants for well over 20 years. If you've got questions or you need help with your transplants, whether you've got questions about watering, temperature, troubleshooting, growing conundrums, you can call them up and get your questions answered. And about that community, Vermont Compost keeps track of who gets every batch of potting soil that they create. And because Vermont Compost deals directly with growers without going through a distributor, they know who's using their potting soils and how they're using them. Vermont Compost Company knows, just like I do, that organic growers are some of the best people on the planet, and they're proud to be part of that community. Taking care of growers by taking care of transplants since 1992. VermontCompost.com. All right, and we're back with, we're actually back with just Dave Perkins from Vermont Valley Community Farm. Barb had to step away. So Dave, tell me about the land that you're farming. I'm looking on the map and, and I've been to your farm, so I know it's hilly, but you guys are like right on the edge of what we call the driftless region out down here in the kind of the the Iowa, Minnesota and, and Wisconsin region where there's just, it's a lot of valleys, a lot of really folded land there. Yeah, uh, we are in the driftless area. It, uh, the last glacier came to within uh, five miles of our farm. Uh, so that's why this is the, when they say driftless, it refers to the last glacier did not hit where we're at. Uh, the, uh, topography was affected by the, uh, uh, the glaciers melting, uh, eroding, uh, through a certain area, creating these valleys with steep hillsides, flats on the tops, flat fields on the top. So it's, a it's a beautiful, beautiful area to, to be in. Um, but what it does is you end up, we're, we're, we're Vermont Valley community farm. So we are in the valley. Uh, the, uh, land is sloped. Uh, we have a little bit that's flat, but most of it you're on, uh, either a slight slope to a steep slope, uh, that we are in the valley here where we farm in the valley. Um, the, the soils are very rich. They're, uh, uh well, they actually vary, but, uh, most of where we do the vegetables, it's a very deep, rich silt loam. Uh, there's actually quite a bit of variability. We have even a little bit of sand in some areas, a little bit of more of a silty clay loam. Uh, in our situation, when we went, made the decision to start the farm 23 years ago, and, and we had been searching for land for a long time, so we, we knew the knew the area in terms of what's available or what the land was. But when we decided to make the decision, there was very few choices to be had in terms of purchasing a property. We ended up buying a 40 acre parcel, most, most of which is a wetlands. Um, sitting here in my office, looking out the window, it's this gorgeous view over the wetlands, but that doesn't grow very good vegetables. Right. <laughs> uh, we have it at the uh, first parcel. It was a, uh, four acres of sloped land. Um, big learning curve for uh, David and trying to grow vegetables on that. Over the course of time, we were able to, uh, to rent uh, land from the neighbors and uh, we were able to buy an additional 20 acres very close to our house. Just, uh, I mean, I can see it from here. Uh, we've rented land down the road in uh, several directions, small little chunks that the, the neighbor, uh, large dairy farmer didn't want to mess with anymore. 
Uh, and then we also purchased some property that's a uh, half an hour tractor drive away uh, that's down in the Wisconsin River Valley, which is flat and sandy. So we're really spread out all over the place. Uh, every time we go to harvest, uh, we're getting in our box truck and our trucks to drive. Uh, there really is nothing where you just walk right out from the packing well. There's a Two acres, but basically everything we have, we're 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 on the road to get there, even though most of it's within you know visual sight. So it's not uh, it's anything but ideal in terms of the arrangement. Uh, we've just made it work. Uh, we're also in the valley, uh, so we get cold here. At the, the from where we sit to the top of the ridge is about 700 feet in elevation difference. Our neighbors at the top of the ridge, uh, their their um, rhubarb, their asparagus, their everything comes in ten to fourteen days before ours does. Uh, they frost late, later, so we're we're in a cool valley once again. Uh, not ideal. Uh, the fog just it's gorgeous. It just settles into the valley. Uh, not a good thing for disease issues. Um, so there's. Uh, lots of challenges we run into where we farm at. Uh, we've made it work. Uh, we grow great vegetables. Uh, not ideal vegetable ground, but just an absolutely gorgeous place to live. Uh, and how much land are you guys farming? How, how much do you have in vegetables now? We do a little under 30 acres uh, in vegetables, but uh, that includes 10 acres. 10 of those 30 are and uh, potatoes, and that has related to our seed potato business. So it's it's about 20 acres in vegetables for the CSA, plus some of that 10 acres, which are you know potatoes go to the CSA. And uh, we manage, you know, if you include all the land, you know, including the wetlands and everything, it's about 100 and. 110 plus acres. Uh, uh, that's not all tillable. Uh, the say about 60 of that is tillable. So we we do a lot of management on land where uh, I wouldn't put vegetables. We do a lot of mulching in our operation. We uh, make round bales of uh, mulch and we do a lot of mulching. So we're basically bringing a. Uh, uh, fertility or uh, organic matter up from ground where I went, I would never dare put a, a broccoli plant, but uh, get it up on the ground where we are doing vegetables. So that's been sort of my philosophy on that to make use of the land that we're managing to improve our vegetables. I don't usually think of mulching as being a strategy that you follow on 20 acres of mixed vegetables. How are you guys managing that? All the I mean, we you know we do what is typical for vegetables and raised beds. Uh, you know we do raised beds in under plastic for tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers and melons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And on those, then once we do our raised bed, we mulch heavily over that. Uh, so you're probably putting about 20 tons of mulch per acre if you want to do it in that framework. So that's very significant amount of material that you're putting down. It's a weed suppression uh, for that season. It's, you know, for the uh, vining crops, it improves your, you know, fruit quality uh, because you're not laying on dirt. Uh, So you get that impact. That's your your year one impact. Your year two is when you till that in, you're putting 20 tons of material down in the earth. Uh, We don't, we don't, uh, do composting, uh, but you know my version of that is uh, the, the mulch we put down, and then in addition, uh, we have enough land where we have a lot of uh, our acres or a significant number in cover cropping, which my go-to cover crop is alfalfa. And it's uh, your nitrogen source for your vegetables, a deep tap root. Uh, there's great organic varieties of alfalfa. Wisconsin alfalfa have been researched to death. There's a, uh, you know, it's it's a very solid crop for us. It fits the rotation well because well, in August is a good time. Mid August is a good time. You're looking to plant it. Your early vegetables are out, so it fits real well to the vegetable system. I can leave it in for one year, two year, three years. I can choose to harvest it for as mulch to go on, 
other ground. I can just let it mow it, let it sit in place. So it's the strategy is not only the mulch, but the mulch crop may just get mulch right in place if it's uh, one of our our parcels where we're growing vegetables. Uh, also, we also do winter rye for mulch, and that's uh, you know a fluffier mulch. So um, we have the equipment, so we're not doing any of this with our backs. It's uh, round bales. We have a round bale processor, so we can chop it and blow it out. It's, it's tractor work and be, can be done quickly and efficiently. Uh, we have to help your mulching and we do a little hand fix up, uh, but that's all it amounts to in terms of our hand labor. So we're losing, moving material within the farm uh, to the spots where it's more important to have it. If you're not doing composting, how are you handling your vegetable waste? Uh, well, our system there is, is uh, our vegetable waste from our packing shed goes into a, a manure slinger spreader, and we don't compost it. We put it back onto the field. Uh, with a slinger is a manure spreader where it just, as you put it out, it just chops it into little pieces and flings it out. Uh, and as everybody knows, this big pile of uh, vegetable materials uh, all of a sudden turns into a very small amount of material when you're composting. Uh, you know, we get the essentially the same effect, but we don't go through the composting process. It's essentially raw material that's chopped and thrown out there. Uh, you know, I I know plenty of farms who have very you know active compost systems, and that's a great thing to do. I compost is great. I get the material onto our land without going through uh, the system. Either it's grown in place or the composting system. Either it's grown in place and just tilled in. Or we put it out there in uh, the more of the raw form, the round bales, that sort of thing. It it works for us. Uh, uh, and again, if farms have a compost system, that's great. You know, it's a good thing. Now, you mentioned that all of the mulching that you're doing is handled mechanically. You guys are a fairly heavily mechanized farm, right? I mechanize everything that I can that makes sense to do. Did you start with that attitude? Uh, yes, I, uh, again, I grew up a farmer. I grew up on a farm. I grew up with farm equipment. I grew up on tractors. Uh, uh, one thing I really like about all our, my, my fellow vegetable farmers, there's a lot of people that are totally new to agriculture. They don't have that background. And I think that's absolutely great. But my background is I'm very comfortable with equipment. Uh, I know how to use it. I know how to create it. I know it, you know, figure things out. And so I use, you know, my skills to, to our advantage. Uh, so yeah, from, well, the very first year, uh, the two things we bought was a greenhouse, which, and a tractor with a couple pieces of equipment. Uh, that's, that's straight from the get go. And, uh, as time goes on, we've, uh, invested heavily, uh, in terms of, uh, infrastructure and meaning equipment and buildings it's too, but, if you can mechanize something uh, and that improves the process, it's it's a no-brainer. You if you can if it's in your budget, you do it, as it's going to improve everything, uh, improve your life, improve your product, uh, improve your you know economic bottom line. So, in my my perspective, it's 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 not even a consideration not to. It's you know, obviously you have to work within your budget. When you guys were first starting out, what kinds of implements did you, I mean, obviously things like tillage, you know, that's in some ways doesn't even really, I don't think of that as mechanization because it's hard to do tillage without mechanization. But what were some of the labor saving things that you invested in right off the bat? Well, you know, in our uh, first years, you know, we uh, attended any kind of, you know, learning sessions we could. And, you know, double digging beds is one of the things we were taught, <laughs> you know, that's uh you know, double dig and double dig your beds. And, you know, we went through the workshops and that struck me as really, you're going to double dig the beds and that's great if you want to do it, but that's sort of, you know, that sort of notion I just rejected. I don't, reject the notion that it's a good thing, but, you know, how can you ever, you know, succeed economically uh, and your back survive doing that sort of thing? So that's just not where I'm coming from. So the first thing you do, well, the, uh, uh, 
I grew up with moldboard plowing. Had a had a little two bottom moldboard plow. We did some of that. Uh, uh, got a you know five foot rototiller. Go buy a little compact Ford you know nineteen ten tractor. Had a tractor had a loader on it. I knew what it meant to pick things up and move things around. Um, little disc. Uh, you know, a little grain drill. Um, trying to figure out uh, which little cedars to use. Uh, well, the Earthway is what Barb still uses in the greenhouse. Um, and for us at the very beginning, the whole, the, the veg, I mean, I grew up on a farm right now to farm. I have an agronomy degree, but I've never, never grew a vegetable. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have a friend of ours who started out with us part-time who was very knowledgeable in vegetables. Uh, and, so he was our he was our knowledge base when it came to individual crops and and what to do. Uh, so equipment wise, it's for me it was figuring out and what what really mattered. Uh, uh, transplanter. We started out first year with a one row mechanical transplanter. We set it offset it so we had two row beds, thirty inches apart. Uh, tractor cultivator. I'm. Grew up cultivating with three-point equipment. Uh, I can do it. Uh, I can drive a tractor straight. You know, I, I just again these skill sets of each each of individual person what they bring. Uh, so we just started off with mechanical transplanters from year one, uh, rototiller, uh, ground tillage, uh, three-point cultivation equipment. But it's really a a big learning curve. Uh, the, the first couple of years to figure out what where to go to and that learning curve really doesn't stop you you keep you keep getting better I mean we're at the point now where uh, you know I'm not adding equipment uh, but we've been doing it for 23 years too you mentioned that you that you're kind of the financials guy on the farm did you come to the farm with a background in financial management well, my uh, graduate degree is in public administration. Uh, I worked for the state of Wisconsin for 10 years for the Wisconsin Legislative Fiscal Bureau, which is the budget office for the legislature. So for 10 years, I was doing budget work, which is it's not accounting. Uh, it's uh, budgeting. So it's really looking at revenues and expenditures. And you know, our job was to be critical. I really learned skills to critically look at numbers and evaluate, uh, you know, learn. You know, we, we, when I started, there were no computers, but by the time I quit, there, there was. And so I learned how to use spreadsheets, how to use those to evaluate things, uh, how to make comparisons, how to create different scenarios. So I really took a whole bunch of those skills that I learned as a budget analyst for the state and apply that to our, our business, our farm. Uh, so that's, so yes, I, I came, came to our farm with, uh, with, uh, financial skills. That I learned through 10 years being a Wisconsin state budget and, uh, uh, reviewing that and doing the work there. When you talked at the beginning about this plan that you guys had to, you know, we're going to get 500 CSA shares in five years. That's where we're, that's where our business is going. Did you have a pretty solid idea of what that was going to take in terms of capital outlay and annual expenditures for for labor and seeds and fertilizer? And on the in the specifics, no. But uh, my budget from a, 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 a say a grander scale and then work back rather than start in the micro level and work up. Uh, it's really it's pretty simple. And that uh, you look at what your your business again. You're running a business here. What your business goals are. Ours were that we would both earn our full time living working on the farm. Uh, we, you know, we knew our what our debt was. You know, I, you know the property uh, related to the farm, and so you can easily uh, create a number uh, of what your expectation is. And that's the number you create for yourself. So if you expect that if two of us working full time and you make up any number you want, we're happy if we bring in 30, or we net, you know, in our pocket for personal spending, uh, 30,000, 20,000, 50,000, 100,000, you make up whatever number you're comfortable with. 
And then that's, that's your goal. And then you can compare that to, okay, when this is where CSA makes it, uh, kind of simple and straightforward and that, well, if we're charging $500 for a share, you do the math, okay, in order just to get to our income, we have to sell this number. And then obviously we have all our expenses and then where do you go from there? So you, you really, we really needed to go in through some years to get a feeling about how our expenses uh, compared to our net. Uh, and then the other thing you throw in here is your capital outlay for investment. And that can vary. You can make all your choices on that. At the very beginning, that, that has to be that has to be uh, significant, but you still have to stay inside your budget on uh, what you know what money you have. Uh, uh, I grew up on a farm where uh, my dad never did debt other than the farm itself, and that's the philosophy I adopted. Uh, we don't do debt for capital purchases. If we don't have the cash, we didn't spend it. So our only debt was the, the property itself. Uh, it's an extremely conservative uh, way to go at financing a business, but also it's extremely safe. And that was the philosophy I used, and and it it, it works for us. So uh, at the beginning, you do have to learn what your expenses are to create so much revenue. But if your revenue, your gross revenue, you're, you know, say you're okay. I'm going to sell ten shares at five hundred. I have five thousand dollars. Well, how am I? How am I going to have a fifty thousand dollar income? Obviously, you know, that's that's an extreme example, but that's is how simple it is. So if I figure out from uh, doing it for a couple of years that oh I can I can net out say thirty percent. Uh, well, now I know where I need to get to on my sales in order to get to the income level that we're comfortable with. And then, you know, you know, I projected out, well, obviously I'm not going to be making a whole lot at the beginning, but, you know, what is the gradual increase and what am I okay with over the course of time? And this is a personal decision. Uh, so at the beginning, no, you're not making much, but... If I stay not making much for 20 years, well, then I was a fool to do this from an economic perspective. But as you, as the farm progresses, if you're growing what the, you know the farmer gets at the end, then that's what you need to do. And where do you want to get to? And what are you happy with? So it's uh, really at a, at a macro budgeting level that you're doing it. Uh, once you for your farm individually, you need to figure out at a micro level how what it costs you to produce X amount of revenue. And that's going to be different for every single farm. Um, Barb and I are both really hard workers. We're really efficient. We're, you know, take no prisoners kind of workers. Uh, <laughs> so we, we're really good at it. Uh, uh, another farm may have a whole different perspective and that's okay for whatever people choose for themselves, but it's going to affect, uh, their, their budget is going to affect those finances. Uh, and you really need to know who you are and what you can do on your your situation, what skill sets you bring. And I'm sure people that are as far out there do it better than us. But, you know, you know, we've done well. In terms of your overall business, then, how do the potatoes fit into that, the, the seed potato operation that you have? Well, at the beginning, it was uh, I started that for a, a couple of reasons. One is to uh, um, kind of respond to the, the new federal rule that required organic seed, if available, uh, prior to the federal law on organics. Uh, it wasn't required, so there was going to be no organic seed market because obviously, why spend the extra money unless you're incredibly dedicated? So the market just wasn't going to happen. Once the rule went in place, then you know I really kind of felt, you know, somebody should step up and start producing organic seed to uh, grow the, you know, organics. And uh, I, you know, we, potatoes is something people are used to. It's something we wanted to grow a lot of for our members. Uh, as, you know, our CSA was growing, we're doing a lot of potatoes. We uh, were buying seed from the East and West Coast and, you know, the seed sucked. It was terrible. And I live in a potato state, Wisconsin's, you know, the third largest producer of potatoes. So I just looked into it 
and uh, learned about uh, uh, certified seed. Uh, there's a state of Wisconsin certified seed program and decided to, well, this is something that you know, we should do to help develop organics. In addition, our uh, son had been, uh, son, oldest son Jesse, is, you know, he works the tractors with me, and uh, I wanted to give him something that was his to uh, uh, develop. And so over time, you know, he's become the, the spud man here on the farm that he is right now. But that, that was sort of the other thing, too, is kind of create a separate business that he'd be more in charge of. So that's how it uh, began. Uh, uh, it's, you know, then it's like any other, you know, retail business, you know, sales grow over time. Um, we're, uh, at the point where we have about, now uh, what, uh, again, Jesse does this now, but about, I think about, uh, two, 300 customers, uh, basically the Midwest, but we do get requests from down South and out East and out West, you know, we'll ship if people want, that wasn't sort of our idea, but, uh, they want to they want to pay the shipping. We'll send it. Uh, so over time, then that business has grown, and as we discussed earlier, uh, we had our peak in our CSA sales, and they've declined. Uh, so the potatoes have become a bigger part of our farm economically, and and acreage. They're well, let's say two acres are CSA, so they're about eight acres out of our thirty are for the potato business, but again, the potatoes are fully automated. It's all mechanical. We, you know, plant with machine, harvest with machine. Uh, the only time we lift the potatoes is once they go in the 50 pound sacks for sale. So that's the, that's the back labor on potatoes. So it's a, it's a crop that's surprisingly difficult to do well. I, you know, you think potato and you know, potato. Well, a lot of things can go wrong with potatoes. Uh, and then additionally, since we are a seed grower, we go through a regulatory program that's very extensive. Wisconsin has a, a strict program, which is very good for our customers because it means they're assured of a really good quality of seed potatoes. Uh, two, two field inspections, a bin inspection, a winter test out or grow out. Uh, cost us a bunch of money, uh, probably about 15 cents a pound on our potatoes for the regulatory program. But then that means for organic growers, they're getting really good uh, seed. And that's, you know, what we, the only thing we would do. But that is really important for organic growers to have excellent seed. And that's what we can do. It has now become more significant for our farm because it's grown and the CSA has gone down a bit. And when you talk about the challenges of growing potatoes, are there additional things that you have to do besides having the inspections in order to be growing certified seed potatoes in Wisconsin? Uh, yeah, there's uh, our, what, what seed we plant is uh, very strictly regulated. We can only plant uh, what is considered foundation quality seed. Um, what we do is we replace our seed each year. And one thing is, you know, we use the word seed. It's not really seed. Uh, you know, your it's, it's potatoes are vegetative reproduction. You know, your potatoes are clone. I mean, you plant a piece of the potato plant, which is, you know, what we call the potato, and it grows and it turns into more potatoes. So what that means is uh, whatever the genetics are that you of that seed piece, i.e. including any viruses in that seed piece, uh, you'll get back. It's it's going to come back. That's why you don't, you know, plant your own seed back. That's why you buy, quote unquote, seed potatoes, because the, the disease level in the seed is low. Uh, and it's through the process that the uh, state of Wisconsin does. It's a uh, or the plant. That what you get actually becomes uh, starts in a petri dish with a cell that's been identified as being disease free. A plant that's grown out, it's grown then that's grown out into a greenhouse, becomes a mini tuber that uh, goes to the state farm up in northern Wisconsin. Uh, goes through one, maybe two generations of reproduction there, and then that, and that comes to the the seed growers. There's about 25 seed growers in Wisconsin. And then, uh, then we grow that and then, then sell that to uh, 
our customers. A lot of uh, certified seed growers will keep their seed for multiple years, uh, uh, as long as their disease levels stay within the certification standard. Uh, the best quality is to replace your seed every year, because then you're basically going back to that that tissue culture. You're getting as close as you can to that. And our seed meets actually foundation quality, which is higher than certified. We don't sell it that way. So, you know, our goal is to make sure our organic growers get disease-free seed the best, you know, that can can be provided. Uh, our, you know, our, our, our quality is as good or better than any of the conventional growers. You know, we're growing the same variety. Well, we grow more varieties than most of them, but... Uh, if you if you know what to look at, uh, you'll you'll see that what our quality is. And we started with the seed program uh, uh, years ago. Uh, we were organic, and of course, we were told we couldn't do it because we were organic. Uh, so I got into a phone argument with the <laughs> head of the program, and we went on and on back and forth. Uh, and then, you know, he didn't use these words, but he said, okay, I'll humor you and we'll send you some seed. You grow it out. We'll test it out in, uh, in our winter test out. And, you know, he didn't use these words, but we'll show you that you can't do it. So I said, okay. And so we got the seed, we grow it out. Didn't change anything we were doing. They tested it out and we hit foundation quality. So he had to, he had to swallow his words. And uh, allow us into the program, uh, but that's all changed now. The the people in the Wisconsin program are really supportive of what we're doing. Uh, they're great to work with. We've learned a lot from them. Uh, so the program now is, you know, you know, from our perspective, is, is you know excellent uh, as regards to working with organics, organic grower. And uh, you know, we we because you know we we prove that we can do the quality, and that's what their concern is. So it's uh it's uh, extensive. We have to do a lot, and then every potato we grow on our farm has to be in the seed program. That's the other thing. We can't just say, "Oh, we're going to do something different over there." It's it's all got to meet a standard. Uh, if they were to come out and see something really bad, uh, they would tell us to to, to take it down, uh, and we'd have to. Um, so you know, we stand a chance of losing our crop every year because we're bringing the most knowledgeable people in. Uh, potatoes in the, in the world <laughs> in the state and they're looking at our farm and they're they're looking for problems that's the whole point of their inspection but we we take a you know that's that's the point of the inspection so we take that that chance every year looking for things like virus or or excessive fungal load uh the big issue with seed is viral inspection or viral infection a whole host i mean it's a wide range of things that can affect potatoes some are catastrophic and it's like you know you need to destroy this crop some are well this is kind of a problem keep an eye out some are well rogue these plants meaning you just go and rip them out of the field um you know for example late blight that would be devastating you know we could not sell our customers late blight inflected seed that would that is not an option uh so that would be one if that hit us you know we you know, we'd be out of our whole year's crop. Uh, uh, and, you know, that's, uh, that's one thing there's, it's, it's, uh, you know, I don't even profess to know all of this. Uh, we, uh, that's why we get our inspections. And again, Jesse has been the one who's kind of gotten more knowledgeable. So, uh, it's a, it's a strict program as, as it, as it should be. If you had one suggestion for doing potato production, what would it be? Uh, get clean seed. <laughs> well, that's okay. <laughs> that is what you start with. Uh, good seed is cheap seed. Uh, as opposed to people saying, oh, it's so expensive. Well, no, that's cheap. Uh, it's, again, it's a perspective. Uh, and two is potatoes are an incredible nutrient hound. Far and away above anything else we grow on the farm. They're just phenomenal nutrient uh, eaters. It's, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd have to see what it is. And second, they're uh, really sensitive to uh, consistent water supply. So they're demanding from a nutrient level. Uh, they're demanding from a, a water uh, perspective. Uh, and, you know, the, the insect issues uh, can largely be addressed with uh, what's available in organics. 
the disease issues can be addressed. Uh, you know, copper is the product that you can do under the disease level, uh, but it's the the uh, change or the impact on your potato crop can be like within a week. It's incredible uh, how fast a, a pest of some sort can uh, really impact the crop. So we've had anything from near failures or actually failures to, you know, 40, over 40,000 pounds per acre. It's, it's the, the, the wide range of possibilities on what you end up is, is pretty interesting. With that, Dave, we're going to turn to our lightning round. First, we're going to get a quick word from one more sponsor, and then we'll be right back. All right. This lightning round and perennial support for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by BCS America. A BCS two-wheel tractor is the only power equipment a market gardener will need with PTO-driven attachments like the rototiller, flail mower, power harrow, rotary plow, snow thrower, log splitter, and more. You name it, you can probably run it with a versatile BCS two-wheel tractor. The first time I used a rototiller way back in 1991, it was mounted to a BCS two-wheel tractor and it spoiled me for life. When you get behind a BCS, you can tell that it's built to the same commercial standards as four-wheel farm tractors, and it has many of the same features. I've used other tillers and mowers, and I spent most of the time that I was using them thinking about how much easier and how much more fun it would be with a BCS. Check out bcsamerica.com to see the full lineup of tractors and attachments, plus videos of BCS in action. Barb, what's your favorite tool on the farm? My favorite tool is my hands. I think hands are the best tool on the farm. And this comes from me because I work with hand labor. Um, I work with, with all the harvest. And I think my second favorite tool is a harvest knife. And if we have a harvest knife in a hand, we can do... Um, we can, we can pro- probably bring almost any vegetable, vegetable into the packing shed. Now, of course, I'm talking about the harvest end of it because that's the end that, that I work on. Is there a particular harvest knife that you really are fond of? Yeah, I like the one with the, um, the, the blunt angle, like the square sides and like the square angle at the front of the knife. Um, I don't know. It probably has a name. I always think of those as a lettuce knife. It's the ones that you can actually push into something as well as making more of a chopping motion. Yes. We use a lettuce knife for everything except zucchini and cucumber. We use it for every other crop. Um, we have to sharpen it all the time since I was going under the dirt, but it's a fantastic tool on this farm. Dave, what's your favorite tool? Uh, hands down tractor. I grew up on a tractor. Um, Kind of like I can feel the ground through the tractor. It made me sound a little bit weird, but that's that's how I grew up. As a kid starting by nine years old, that was my life. And then uh, out here, we uh, do a lot with uh, our tractors. We're very mechanized. Uh, it uh, basically sort of gets the everything to the point of harvest. And it's where then Barb comes in. So um, easy answer for me. And Dave, what's your favorite crop to grow? Oh, favorite crop to grow. You know, I don't really have one. Um, to me, it's sort of the, the whole farm's, a, uh, you know, an entity. I would say I there's some things that happen related to the crops that are frustrating. So it's almost more the flip. My favorite crop to grow is the one that just comes out just the way we had it planned. <laughs> uh, so whichever one that is, uh, kind of, wow, everything worked just the way it was supposed to, uh, kind of, the, the my least favorite crop is the one that the wild, we have tons of wildlife around here. The one that the wildlife have just brought me to a point where I just, you know, do we even grow this anymore? It's so frustrating. You put in all these work, everything's right. And then the deer or the turkey or the sandhills or the blackbirds or the coyotes, they come in and they destroy it and they always do it just before it's harvestable. So um, my favorite crop is the one that works out perfect and least is the one that we lose. Barb, what's your favorite crop to grow? You know how many people ask me this question all the time and I have a heck of a time answering it. So I was actually thinking about it while Dave was talking and I'm going to say that I have tomatoes are fascinating to me and I have learned so much about tomatoes over the years. And we have, I don't know, 50, 80 different, maybe even more varieties of tomatoes that we've grown over the years. 
And um, we've been doing breeding trials with Johnny's um, seed company for the last three or four years. And as the breeders have come out to visit their, their trials every year, I have learned all kinds of stuff about breeding tomatoes, which I never knew before. I don't have any formal education in that. So that's been really fascinating to me. So I find tomatoes particularly fascinating. I don't know that my, they're, that they're my favorite for any other reason. But um, For us, a cool tomato breeding fact. Well, I just learned we're growing three pink tomatoes this year. And then I learned the parent. And of course, I make really close observation about how soft we need to harvest them or how underripe so they don't get over soft. And I just learned that one of the pink tomatoes that we're growing this year is parentage is two heirloom varieties. Single. That was fascinating. It's like, oh, no wonder this one is softer than the other two that it looks exactly like. The breeders look at things like if they take like a wild tomato and breed it with a, a, you know, domesticated one, how the foliage is going to be more wild and how they're trying to, you know, control that. So just walking through the fields with them and and hearing them talk and and looking at things in in those ways um, has brought me really new curiosity about tomatoes. Very cool. And this one's for both of you guys. If you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer selves one thing, what would it be? Balance your work with your life so that you don't keep getting hurt. <laughs> it's not possible for me though. I'm too, I'm too focused. I'm, I'm too much of a, <laughs> I, I couldn't do it, but if I could, if I wouldn't have had my shoulder surgery and my torn ankle and my torn knee and everything else, because I just overdid it constantly. Learn more about ergonomics. It, if I wasn't who I was, the farm wouldn't be as successful. But if I actually knew now as much about my body as I, 23 years ago as I know now, and I've actually formally studied yoga in, intensively just to learn about my body and just to be able to keep it healthy. Yeah, if I'd have known all of that 23 years ago, it might have been helpful. Dave, how about you? Now that I know what I know now, I would say whatever parcel of land you choose to farm on, uh, understand what is a good vegetable, good vegetable land, and, you know, hold out for it uh, as opposed to trying to work with something that's not and get more than you need. So it's, you know, we've, we've made do. Uh, we're in the Vermont Township in Western Dane County at and it looks like the state of Vermont. It's rolling. It's gorgeous. It is absolutely not vegetable ground. Uh, we've been successful. We're scattered all over the place. We drive down the road all the time to get to where we're going. And I just think, boy, wouldn't it be wonderful if we had one big square piece of fabulous vegetable land and how much easier it would be and what the impact would be on our management and our production and just everything. So if I were starting over, uh, as much as I'm really happy where we're at, I would absolutely not, you know, start where we're at. I would find great vegetable ground and it would be, it would be really key in, in the success. Barb and Dave, thank you so much for being part of the Farmer to Farmer podcast today. Chris, it's been really fun talking with you and talking about all the different parts of our farm. Yeah, thanks for having us. All right, so wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 134 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. You can find the notes for this show at farmertofarmerpodcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Perkins. That's P-E-R-K-I-N-S. The transcript for this episode is brought to you by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk-behind farming equipment and high-quality garden tools in North America. And by Rock Dust Local, the first company in North America specializing in local sourcing and delivery of the best rock dust and biochar for organic farming. And by Local Food Marketplace, providing an integrated, scalable solution for farms and food hubs to process customer orders, including online ordering, harvesting, packing, delivery, invoicing, and payment processing. Additional funding for transcripts is provided by North Central SARE, providing grants and education to advance innovations in sustainable agriculture. You can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast right in your inbox by signing up for my email newsletter at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. And also, if you enjoy the show, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review or talk to us in the show notes or tell your friends about us on Facebook. 
And hey, when you talk to our sponsors, please let them know how much you appreciate their support of a resource you value. You can support the show by going to farmtofarmpodcast.com slash donate. I'm working to make the best farming podcast in the world. And you can help. Thanks for everybody out there who's been willing to sign up and be a patron to the show. Finally, please let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmertofarmerpodcast.com, and I will do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there. Keep the tractor running.